All right. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon or good evening or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're pleased to bring you the latest in our 2017 webinar series on the topic of practical tools for impact design, focusing on Fusion 260. My name is Yana Aranda, and I am the Director of Programs here at Engineering for Change, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. Now, the webinar you're participating in today is part of E4C's professional development offerings. Information on upcoming webinars in this series, as well as archived videos of past presentations, can be found on E4C webinars webpage, as well as on our YouTube channel. Both of the URLs are listed here for your reference. If you have any questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics and speakers, please contact the E4C webinar series team at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. And if you're following us on Twitter today, we invite you to join the conversation with our hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. Now, before we get rolling, we'd like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change and who we are. E4C is a knowledge organization and global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists. We are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities around the world. Some of those challenges include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and so forth. We invite you to become an E4C member. Membership is free and provides access to news, data on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and opportunities such as jobs and fellowships. E4C members enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with the E4C site, the better we will be able to serve you resources aligned to your interests. For more information, please see our website engineeringforchange.org to learn more and sign up. Our next webinar will be on June 28th uh, with what will be, will build on our existing mobile data collection series from 2016. We'll be joined by Dr. Joel Selanikio, who is the CEO and co-founder of MacPy. Join to learn about multiple approaches to collecting and visualizing electronic data from the field in the context of MacPy a web-based system that combines data collection, reporting, and messaging tools. Please see the E4C Professional Development page soon for more information and registration details. If you're already an E4C member, we'll be sending you an invitation to the webinar directly. Now, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Let's practice using this webinar platform by telling us where you are in the world. In the chat window, which is located at the bottom of your screen, bottom right-hand corner, please type in your location. I will get us started so everybody can see how we're doing this. All right, there's one. Um, if the chat is not open on your screen, try clicking the chat icon in the top right-hand corner. So we see folks here from Denver, Colorado, from Ottawa and Canada, San Francisco, Welcome, everyone. If you have any technical questions, uh, feel free to use this window to send a private chat to the Engineering for Change admin, or you can just use the chat window to speak to the other participants. So welcome from Pennsylvania and Chicago. During the webinar, and I see some of you already started this, please use the Q&A window to type your questions for the presenter. Um, that way we can keep track of them. If you are listening to the audio broadcast and have any trouble, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening WebEx up in a different browser. As you know, E4C webinars qualify engineers for one professional development hour. To request yours, please follow the instructions on the top of the E4C professional development page after the presentation. And the URL is listed on this slide. Now, I'm pleased to introduce you to today's presenters and talk a little bit about the topic. Integrating design strategies into product modeling and simulation is a practical way to design for energy efficiency, integrate green materials, and minimize environmental impact. Today, we'll explore Autodesk's 
Autodesk's Fusion 360, an integrated concept to production tool set, and learn how impact designers are leveraging the software to deliver innovative solutions. We'll be joined by Andre Mooring, who is a product learning experience lead working with the Autodesk Sustainability and Foundation team to elevate sustainable design practice with Autodesk software, specifically Fusion 360. Andrew is currently a senior at Northwestern University studying, studying manufacturing and design engineering, has a background in industrial design, product development, and mechanical engineering. He is joined by his colleague Zoe Bispaco, who is a designer, environmental engineer, and globetrotter who strongly believes in the smart use of technology and design as a key to solving global issues. She started her career as an environmental engineer in France and Colombia before managing a project with designers in Southeast Asia on sustainable innovation. This led her to uncover a new interest in design and its potential to impact the world. She now combines her competencies and passions within her role at the Autodesk Foundation, the first foundation to focus corporate philanthropy on design that addresses environmental, social, health, and education challenges. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Andre and Zoe to take you through our presentation today. everyone, my name is Zoe and I work at the Autodesk Foundation and just as an introduction I wanted to tell you a little bit more about our organization. So we are um, the foundation of Autodesk and we provide supports to organizations such as non-for-profits, startup, innovators and entrepreneurs using design and hardware to solve the world's most pressing issues such as climate change or health system resilience. And once again, hi everyone, my name is Andre Moore. I'm the Product Learning Experience Lead with Autodesk. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about um, Autodesk Fusion 360, um, which is one of Autodesk's flagship uh, CAD CAM softwares. It's a um, very powerful tool in that it allows you to design, test, and fabricate all within one single software and really easily interact between all of those different workspaces. Additionally, it's an entirely cloud-based platform, uh, which allows you to really easily collaborate um, between project teams um, across, across space um, and different platforms. Just so that everyone knows, um, Fusion 360 is actually a free software for all enthusiastic hobbyists and startups. So if, if you actually go on this uh, web page and you have the address on the bottom right, uh, you can download the free trial and then uh, request for full access. Additionally, um, the Autodesk Foundation have programs, software donation program for mission-driven organization. So if you are a startup, you can apply to our Entrepreneur Impact Program and actually um, receive not only Fusion 360, but the full product design collection, including uh, Inventor as well. And we have an equivalent for non-for-profit uh, registering for a technology impact program where you can uh, have as well a product design collection as well as architecture. Cool. So uh, once again, we're going to be di diving in a little bit into Fusion 360 today. Um, specifically, we're going to be taking a look at three uh, functionalities of this software. Um, first, we're going to look at the sculpt workspace. Um, second, we're going to look at some of the collaboration tools that are available within the software. And third, we're going to be looking at the simulation workspace and all that that offers for you. So with that, let's, let's dive in. So we're going to start out by talking a little bit about the sculpt workspace, which essentially allows you to work with a solid model in the same way that you might work with a piece of clay with your hands. Um, more specifically, it does so um, by allowing you to create free-form shapes um, using T-spline bodies or T-spline entities, um, which essentially divides a model into a series of splines and subcomponents um, that you can then translate, rotate, and reform by clicking and dragging the model. Additionally, you can use um, what we'll call the edit form functionality, which we'll demonstrate in just a little bit, um, to modify existing models. You can really easily go back and forth between a more uh, typical modeling workspace and this sculpt workspace. 
and yeah, again, those those two workspaces are uh, really well integrated, so you can just go back and forth between the two um, and use both function both functionalities uh, quite seamlessly. So the idea was um, that I wanted to take you through an inspiring ex example from the Autodesk Foundation portfolio using some of these um, uh, methods in Fusion so that you can see really what can be delivered by using uh, Fusion 360 before having you uh, having Andre going and diving into uh, the uh, software itself. So for the scoped environment, I'd like to introduce you to uh, one project that we supported with the Autodesk Foundation called Testing of wa our, our Water. Um, it was actually recently presented at a previous Engineering for Change webinar, so it might sound familiar. But for those who don't know about it, uh, Testing Our Water is a project that engages citizens on designing, fabricating, and using do-it-yourself trolls to collect and measure ocean plastic pollution. So these trolls are these little pictures you can see on the right that basically collect uh, water and uh, water samples to help uh, measuring the pollution uh, from either a boat or a bridge or even uh, just um, from the banks of a river. So for one of their trolls uh, called the Ray Trolls, they use biomimicry principle and got inspired by how the Ray eats and moves in the water. They started doing some hand sketches and even clay model to first prototype the, tra the troll uh, model. And they were able to directly import these drawings and models uh, in Fusion 360 and start using the sculpt environment to directly model uh, the organic shape as close as possible from uh, the mouth of the ray. Uh, they then 3D printed their model and tested it and it worked. Um, I would definitely recommend you to look into their website as you can find some video uh, of their success. And Barrent Ross, their main designer, shared with us that working with the sculpt mode is the closest app to digital clay I have ever experienced. Back to you, Andre. Awesome. So now that you guys have gotten to see a little bit of an example of how uh, the sculpt workspace can be applied um, in an impact design setting, um, let's dive into the software itself and take a look at this functionality in action. So say we want to go ahead and take this simple rectangular form here um, and turn it into a more ergonomic handle. We're going to be using the edit form function, uh, which can be found by clicking on the modify icon. Um, here we have the edit form dialog box, which is opened up. And this will now allow us to make edits on T-spline entities, which are essentially um, divisions of the model into a series of transformable uh, vertexes, edges, and faces. Um, if we go ahead and select one of these entities, I'm just going to click on a couple on the end here. We're going to control click to select uh, multiple entities. This manipulator will appear, um, which will allow you to either rotate, translate, or scale any of these entities. Um, now, steps you can rotate, translate, or scale um, with the three um, types there. Now, if you find that in, the manipulator is a little bit cluttered, you can change the transform mode over on the right here to select just one of those. Um, but we're going to be using the uh, multi-transform mode for this demonstration. So now we're going to want to um, shrink these four entities on the end to make the model a little bit more curvature continuous. And so what we're going to do is control click. And what that will actually do is create a small extrusion and then uh, shrink the corresponding entities, um, which will create a um, continuous curve around the edge of our model um, without impacting the shape of our model. Um, so now we're going to kind of begin uh, to create this more ergonomic shape. We're going to reopen the edit form uh, workspace. And we're going to try and scale down the entities across the bottom of this rectangle. So we're going to go ahead and select all those just by control clicking. And we're just going to click and drag on the scale transform. And you can see how we've immediately um, started to create a more ergonomic shape. Um, now we're going to want to try to create the individual finger contours for this handle. Um, so we're going to click on the edge on the end. Um, we're going to try to view this um, orthogonally here. And then we're just going to translate that straight down. 
and that'll kind of create the end of our handle to prevent your hand from uh, falling off the back. So now we're going to click on three of the alternating underside edges, um, and we're going to do a similar translation. Oops, let's get those. Um, do a similar translation on these um, to start to create our finger inlets for this handle. And so you can kind of see how it's starting to um, quickly form into a handle shape. And lastly, we're going to grab this um, remaining edge and translate that down. And so you can see here how we were uh, very quickly able um, to create a pretty complicated solid model, um, which through standard um, lofting and uh, sweeping techniques might be a little bit more complicated or would require um, uh, surface modeling techniques or a combination of the above. But we were instead able to take it from a a simple uh, rectangular model into this more complex model um, with just a few uh, very intuitive actions. So now we uh, just talked a little bit about the Sculpt workspace. Um, now we're going to dive into the um, collaboration tools offered by Autodesk, or by uh, Fusion 360, rather. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, Fusion 360 is entirely a cloud-based software. Um, which first and foremost allows you to save, share, and collaborate on your designs all through the cloud, um, which we refer to as A360. And the way we kind of like to think of this as is like a Google Doc or a Google Drive um, for 3D modeling. Uh, similarly, you can host uh, what's called a live review, uh, where you essentially are able to manipulate a model, manipulate the view, as well as actually make changes to a model. Um, and have viewers that can access this through um, just a regular browser link, um, watch your man manipulations in real time um, on any platform at all. So we'll give a little bit of a demonstration of that later. And lastly, um, this cloud platform and the actual software interface are entirely integrated through what we call the data panel, um, which is located on the left side of the interface. And we'll be giving a little bit of a demonstration of that as well. So another example from the Autodesk Foundation portfolio that have successfully used the collaboration tool within Fusion 360 is an organization called GoSol. Uh, GoSol is uh, designing and fabricating solar concentrators to deploy in low energy resource areas and particularly in Africa. Their solar concentrators can be plugged to different types of applications such as an oven like in this picture or roaster for coffee or peanuts or even a water desalinization. And it empowers local community on building businesses. They've been working with Fusion 360 on designing uh, their uh, solar concentrator, and uh, they are right now prototyping a new design that will be shippable, lightweight, and fast to deploy so that they can speed up their international deployment of the technology. They're actually right now working uh, within uh, Pier 9, which is Autodesk Innovation Space here in San Francisco, to accelerate their uh, prototype process. They are constantly in contact with their design team in Kenya, and they are using Fusion 360 uh, to easily communicate the design changes and offer improvement uh, in real time. So they shared with us that uh, using Fusion 360 really helped them speed up their design process and the back and forth between the different teams internationally. And in that sense, we believe that it helped them delivering impact faster as well. Awesome. So once again, now that we've kind of gotten to see how these collaboration tools can be used um, in a real impact design setting, um, let's, let's dive into the software and look at what this looks like um, from a software end. So we're going to start out by showing how you can actually save a model uh, directly to a project folder on the cloud. Um, so when we open up this Save dialog box, uh, you'll see all of your previously saved projects. Um, you can save with, of course, with a name as well as a description and a tag, which can be helpful when uh, collaborating between teams. So we're going to go ahead and populate those. And so we can see all of our previously existing projects below here. 
um, but we're going to go ahead and create a new project for this part. So we're going to populate that, and now that new project is saved onto our cloud database. Now the primary access point uh, to all of the cloud-based projects is through the data panel, um, which is accessed through an icon on the upper left side of the interface. So we're going to go ahead and click on that icon, Show Data Panel. And this data panel allows you and your collaborators to access all of the project folders directly from the software itself. So it's kind of, it, it's kind of like a portal um, between you within the software and your cloud-based platform. So now we're going to go ahead and search um, for a pre-existing model. We're going to look for our tissue extraction device here as an example. Um, and we're going to want to go ahead and make a quick edit to this model. So we're just going to use the modify functionality like we saw before and just drag um, that piece out to make a, extend the extrusion a little bit. Now we're going to go ahead and hit save and we're prompted to save a version description. Um, so collaborators on this model will know exactly what edit was made to this specific version. Now, say that we want a new person to be able to work on this model with us. We're going to head back to our data panel. We're going to open up a project. And we're going to go to the people in the project. And we're going to, um, just like you would with a Google Doc, we're going to invite someone specific via email. And then were you to do that, you would then click Invite there. Now, say we want to simply share a model uh, publicly uh, we're going to go back to our data panel, go into a specific model that we want to share, and we're just going to hit uh, Share Public Link. And this will, um, again, similarly to a Google Doc, give you a link that you can um, then share publicly to anyone with the Fusion 360 software, um, and anyone with this link can then access this model. So now we talked a lot about using the data panel to access the cloud, um, but you can also do so through the AC A360 browser, which we just opened um, by hitting Open Details in A360. Um, so A360 is essentially um, the Google Drive for all of your products. Um, and so you and your teams um, can use this interface here, this online interface, to access all of your projects, um, as you can see over on the right side here, and this is accessible through any browser. Um, so you can um, access the same interface and work on multiple of your, uh, many of your projects um, through a series of platforms, even if it's not a platform um, that is familiar to you. So that was one example of how you can kind of use uh, the cloud-based uh, service as a drive, essentially, for your and your team's uh, collaborative projects. Um, now we're going to take a look at um, what we call a live review, um, which I mentioned briefly before. Um, so say you want to host a live review of this model here. Um, we're going to open up our preferences, hit preview, and we're going to go yep, hit preview. We're going to go to live review. We're going to head up to File, go down to Live Review Session, and we're going to copy and paste this public link. And this link can then be accessed, um, anyone with the link on any platform, including mobile devices, um, can then open our review section and we'll view the model, we'll view the model um, as we manipulate it in real time. Now we're going to act here as both the viewer and the host um, to show that you can both chat with your viewers um, using this chat box along the left side here, um, as well as actually change who is in control of the model itself. So now we've just changed the control over to the right uh, browser so this person can uh, look at something that they need to and reply to your chat, for example. Um, so now say you need to actually edit a specific um, part of the model on the spot, 
you can do so, um, and your viewers will then see the edits that you made in real time. So this, again, here is another way um, that you can use Fusion to collaborate uh, really well across different platforms and space. Um, and it's a functionality that is um, really not offered by other competitive software in the same way. So lastly, the third um, pillar of Fusion 360, at least, that we're going to be talking about today um, is the simulation workspace. Now, Fusion 360 has a really, really powerful uh, simulation, some simulation tools. It uses the industry standard um, NASTRAN solver for those that are more familiar and have worked with simulation in the past. Um, it offers a series of simulation types, including um, our typical uh, thermal and static stress uh, finite element analysis. Um, it also offers a structural buckling and uh, event simulation analysis. And lastly, a kind of new flagship uh, functionality is the shape optimization tool, which will allow you to um, remove material, or at least inform you as to how you can remove material uh, from a part based on a series of applied loads and constraints. And so we'll be giving um, a demonstration on the shape optimization tool specifically in just a little bit. And once again, as has been a theme uh, with these past uh, couple of functionalities, is that it's really easy to quickly switch between, um, in this case, the modeling and the simulation workspace, um, which again, you've kind of seen with all these tools. Um, it's really easy to go back and forth between the different workspaces uh, that you might want to access. Um, and here, you know, if you need to run a, if you need to update your model, then run a simulation, and then update your model again based on the simulation. Um, you can do so really, really quickly just by switching between the workspace um, in a way that you might need to uh, switch between different software packages, um, typically. Thank you, Andre. So another and last example from the Autodesk Foundation portfolio and an organization uh, called Design That Matter that is really successfully embracing uh, Fusion 360 um, and very excited by the functionality of it. So Design That Matter actually uses human-centered design to design and distribute medical devices in emerging countries and particularly in Southeast Asia. And one of their flagship products is called the Firefly, and it's a photoluminescence device that treats baby with jaundice, um, and particularly this picture has been taken in Vietnam. And so what it does is that it pulls a UV light on the baby, on the top of the baby, while heating them up from the bottom to keep their core temperature high. They used uh, Fusion 360 to design the Firefly and the heating basin, as you can see in this picture. And then they used simulation tool, and particularly um, the heat analysis, to see the propagation of heat throughout uh, the design of the device. And they were able to look at how um, the heat affects the different components of the device, as well as making sure that uh, the distribution of heat will keep the baby body warm all over um, the treatment process. They shared with us that it really helped them uh, looking at the efficiency and the safety of the device before prototyping, and that really helped them accelerate the prototyping phase for testing uh, in Vietnam uh, and hospital as soon as um, they designed the device. Fantastic. So that was an example of how you can use the um, heat stress uh, finite element analysis within Fusion. Um, but because there are so many um, different simulation types that we can do, we wanted to give a, de a demonstration of a different simulation type. And as I mentioned uh, briefly before, um, this is kind of a new flagship functionality, the shape optimization simulation, uh, which will allow you to um, essentially lightweight a part or a subset of a model um, based on applied loads. So we're going to dive into the software one last time here and give you guys a look as to how you can do that in Fusion. So 
So we're going to go ahead and open a lever arm model, um, which you can actually find in the, in the simulation samples within your Fusion package. And we're going to head straight over to the simulation workspace. We're going to open a shape optimization study. And now we're ready to define our study. So we're going to begin by defining our material constraints and loads, as well as a couple of other more unique parameters that I'll touch on. So for the material, uh, we're actually going to keep it at steel, as it is now. For the constraints, based on the uh, functionality of this specific part, we're going to apply two pin constraints on each of these hole inlets, which essentially um, prevents uh, horizontal or vertical translation, but not rotational. So we applied those two constraints there. Now for our load, uh, our load is going to be applied at the end of this lever arm. So we're going to select the face of application. We're going to set this load to be 500 newtons. Uh, next, because, uh, because the pinholes are um, integral to the functionality of this device, we're going to want to preserve those regions um, so that they, uh, our lightweighting process does not take away material from there. So we're going to use the preserve region functionality. And we're going to set a radius around the inside of this hole that will not be affected by the results of our simulation. So we set an 8 millimeter radius there. And we're going to go ahead and set a 6 millimeter, six millimeter radius uh, around the other hole. And again, that will make sure that our lightweighting simulation does not remove any material within that radius. Next, because our model is uh, symmetrical across the horizontal plane, we're going to want to keep this symmetry um, with our lightweight inversion. So we're going to create a symmetry plane. And we're going to set that as the horizontal plane by clicking on that horizontal face. Uh, lastly, um, to increase the accuracy of our simulation, um, we want to decrease our mesh size. And the mesh is essentially a division of the model um, that's used to simulate um, the applied loads. And so we're going to decrease that mesh size to about uh, 1 or 2% of the model size. So now we're all ready to um, solve this simulation. And we have a pre-check here that indicates that we're ready to go. And so we're going to click Solve. Now. Uh, all uh, simulations are within Fusion 360 are solved on the cloud, um, which can be very, very helpful considering that simulations take up a lot of RAM and a lot of time. So now our simulation has been finished here. Um, we're looking currently at the load path criticality results. You can use this slider to view areas of more or less uh, critical material. And we're going to look at the mass ratio um, down on the left, uh, lower left-hand corner and set that at about 50%. You can kind of see how here how it's starting to maybe inform a potential truss design for a more lightweight version of this model. So now in order to actually uh, make an update on our part based on this model, we're going to want to import our simulation results uh, back into the modeling workspace. And so we're going to do so um, by with what's called promoting it back into the workspace. We're going to go up to results and click promote. And now you can see that our simulation results are superimposed over our initial model, which has now um, been turned into a transparent uh, appearance. So to uh, ch make changes to this model based on our simulation results. We're going to go ahead and just create a sketch on the top face. And we're going to start to just freehand a sketch um, directly based on our simulation results. So you can see how we're kind of following the contours of material removal uh, that were created by our simulation. Now, I skipped ahead and applied a bunch of parallel constraints, fillets, and other um, pretty typical sketching tools that I didn't want to go into detail into this demonstration. Um, but now we have our final um, sketch here that we're going to use to create an extrusion to actually cut away from this model um, and lightweight our final part. 
So we're going to go up to click on the extrude icon. We're going to go ahead and select each of these uh, individual contours that we created with our sketch. Um, we're going to set it to a cut extrude uh, through all. You can kind of see how that's going to look there with that preview. And we're going to click OK. And now we've made this extrusion. And then if we hide our um, mesh body, which was created by the simulation, you can see how we've uh, now lightweighted this part to about 50% of its original mass. And you can imagine that if this part were uh, a member of a much more complicated assembly, uh, which consisted of 200 different parts, um, all of which were lightweighted through a similar process, you can imagine how we can uh, decrease the weight of a, a really complicated product um, significantly, uh, which has huge impacts um, in terms of the um, sustainability performance of the part. So if you're thinking about, um, for example, um, parts in a car, the uh, mileage of a car specifically um, is greatly determined based on the weight of the car, which is in turn determined based on the weight of its um, individual parts. And so if you are to apply lightweighting practices like this one um, to the individual subcomponents of your assembly, such as a car or anything else, um, it, that can have a huge impact on the sustainability factors, um, as well as the, um, the sustainability factors of the uh, manufacturing process itself, um, taking in consideration um, the material usage um, of the individual parts. So that has been a um, kind of a quick demonstration of three, three uh, I would say, flagship functionalities of Fusion 360. Now, um, that is definitely not all that Fusion offers. It is a um, very, very powerful tool that offers um, truly like an impressive amount of um, different functionalities. Um, and so if you're looking to learn a little bit more about Fusion, um, you can head to the um, Fusion Learn page um, online where you'll find um, quite intuitive demonstrations, video demonstrations similar to those that I just did, as well as hands-on exercises um, uh, looking at a different, um, all the different functionalities within Fusion. So I would strongly recommend checking out that page, um, as well as um, the Autodesk Foundation offers um, a platform called the Autodesk Sustainability Workshop, um, where you can uh, learn uh, a lot of practices within Fusion, um, as well as other Autodesk tools, um, specifically with attention to sustainable design and sustainable practice, and looking at specifically how um, you can use Autodesk tools, um, both, both in the product design setting, like we were just looking um, with that lightweighting example, as well as the um, a building design and architecture setting. Um, so if you head to um, sustainabilityworkshop.autodesk.com, there's a link down on the lower left-hand corner there. Um, you can check out a lot of that learning content um, as well as a bunch of other information um, regarding sustainable design specifically. And lastly, once again, um, you can, uh, for students, educators, as well as those um, working in a impact design setting, typically, you can get Fusion 360 for free. Um, for, and you can do, uh, do so by going to autodesk.com, products, and Fusion 360. And you can um, figure out there how you can download um, the Fusion 360 platform um, for free for you to use. So thank you very much. And we're going to pass it back off um, to our Engineering for Chain host. And we are going to go through some of your um, questions that you have um, that might have come up throughout this presentation. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Andre. So uh, a couple of questions uh, on my end while we uh, see if anybody has uh, some questions from the audience specifically. So um, one of uh, the concerns for many social entrepreneurs uh, who are designing um, you know, impact uh, products uh, that is that uh, you know they they want to kind of keep some security around their design. Uh, can you speak a little bit to the collaborative environment and 
um, and whether or not your space is secure within the collaborative environment or is everybody able to see, uh, you know, your activity in the sandbox area or is this something you can do about making it private? Can you just kind of talk to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you as a Fusion user are entirely in control of who is able to see um, the work that's being done um, within your A360 um, cloud environment. Um, of course, anything on that site is encrypted, so um, there's, no, there's no concern of um, any kind of unintentional leakage of information. Um, but additionally, you are in totally in charge of who is able to collaborate with you on a specific project. So um, when I was giving demonstrations, I was you know, definitely emphasizing um, the collaborative nature and team-based work um, that's being done. So it was kind of showing you know, all the ways in which lots of people can be looking at one model and that kind of thing. However, um, you are entirely able to work 100% independently on a on a model or on anything, um, and you can and you can use the cloud-based service in the exact same way. Um, in the same way, you might have your own um, uh, secure documents on a Google Drive that no one can access. Um, you can have the same the same uh, models or assemblies or anything that you're working on within the software um, entirely private to you. So there is. Um, definitely a distinction between your private workspace um, as well as those um, team-based projects that you have then intentionally shared with a group um, with the mm -hmm. sharing methods that I described. Did that answer the question? Yes, absolutely. And I think as an extension to that, it would be great to hear uh, specifically how users can create an A360 Cloud account. Absolutely. So. Um, there's a couple of ways to do that. Um, firstly, if you if you download um, Fusion 360 um, as well as other um, Autodesk softwares that use the A360 Cloud platform, um, you'll be prompted immediately uh, to create that account, uh, just because that is, of course, the platform that the software inherently uses. Um, otherwise, um, if you uh, simply just go online and you can either type into Google search. Um, Autodesk login or create Autodesk account. Um, you can create an A360 account um, online without even downloading the software. Um, mm -hmm. And then you will then actually through that platform be able to, dis to download the software from there. Um, so creating that account and setting up, um, setting up that platform is just as easy as um, creating a a Google account or a Google Drive, for example. Excellent. So one of one of our listeners wants to know if uh, it's possible to get training on, um, and he says Autodesk Simulator, but I think you mean Fusion 360 uh, simulation tools remotely or in person. So I, I think you mentioned a couple of resources, but maybe you can revisit uh, how individuals can receive that training beyond this webinar, obviously. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, if you, uh, so I think maybe, maybe uh, Zoe can touch on in person more if that's uh, if there is opportunities for that. I'm less familiar with that specifically, um, but there is uh, a plethora of platforms online um, where you can learn about Fusion 360 and specifically the simulation tools. Um, if you go to um, the Fusion Help page, which we can um, post a link to within this chat, um, and you go down to the Simulate tab, um, you'll see a series of demonstrational videos, some of which are similar to the ones um, that I did today, as well as hands-on um, hands exercises where you're actually able to download a model and follow a step-by-step -step process on your own computer within your own software. Um, and learn how to use the tools that way. Um, so yeah, I would recommend um, you can. I would say the easiest way is to just to type into Google uh, Fusion Help, um, and it'll be the first thing that comes up. Um, and then if you look for simulation there, you'll find um, all kinds of all kinds of um, content regarding that, um, as well as the um, uh, s sustainability workshop that I mentioned before. Um, there's uh, lots of content on there regarding simulation specifically um, and how you can use simulation for sustainable design. Um, 
And Zoe, I if you have any, yeah, anything about um, other opportunities for that. Sure. Online also, I would just add that Autodesk um, has a platform called Design Academy that is not only for Fusion but for every uh, Autodesk software where there is a lot of like example and there is courses that sometimes are, you know, five hours to 10 hours to even 20 hours courses. Um, we also partner with Udemy and Coursera, so some, some curriculum are there as well to really do deep dives. Um, for in-person opportunity, if uh, Parkesh, you are a non-for-profit or an entrepreneur in the impact design space and have applied to one of our program within uh, the Autodesk Foundation that I presented at the beginning of the webinar, uh, meaning either our technology impact program or our entrepreneur impact program, we do have opportunities for in-person training with some of our partners. Um, that is something that um, you can tell us um, while you are registering to this program if you are interested. Thank you so much, Zoe. So actually, I don't know if either one of you wants to share some examples. Uh, the Sustainability Workshop is a fantastic resource, and one of the things that's of interest to many of uh, entrepreneurs and designers in industry is how to integrate, you know, improved material choices um, into their design. Are there some examples or some of your favorites from uh, the Sustainability Workshop that you want to highlight uh, that demonstrate uh, the use of these materials, or a particular section even that you think is really worth the attention of, of our listeners, or all of it? <laughs> Well, um, I'm just going to do an intro, but the idea of sustainability workshop and I think in general sustainable design is that there are a lot of concepts that are not even software-based, that you need to know and understand and sort of uh, integrate into your design process around, you know, understanding a life cycle of a product, understanding how material not only impacts uh, the product, but also the manufacturing processes, as well as even the use phase and the end of life of the product. And so Sustainability Workshop is great because it has sort of this, um, it's looking both at the fundamental concept of sustainable design that needs to be understood, and then it's also looking at how you can apply uh, some of these concepts using uh, Autodesk software. Um, maybe, um, Andrew, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the examples that you developed around uh, material choices? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it actually in many ways um, connects back to uh, the example that I was just showing previously before the Q&A session started. Um, one, one way that you can use the um, simulation functionalities in Fusion to assist with your material selection process um, is by creating multiple studies uh, so, for example, in the in the demo that I just did, um, we created just one study and then followed through on um, on that specific study. How, however, you can create multiple studies um, based on one model. And what you can do um, is, for each study, um, you can have the the primary uh, variable being changed is the material. And then you can follow through on either a static stress simulation um, or even a, a material reduction simulation, shape optimization, like I just demonstrated, um, as well as any of the other simulation um, functions within Fusion. And if you have, say, six different studies that you run um, where the variable is material, you can immediately see how um, material choices will affect um, will affect the performance of your part or of your assembly or of whatever you're designing in Fusion. And so then if you have um, information um, as to the sustainability factors of these individual materials, um, you know, including their embodied energy, um, recyclability, end of life options, things like that, you can then kind of combine all of those all of the information that's provided to you um, to make um, a well-educated decision about the material selection um, for your part. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of one example that comes to mind, um, and that, that is discussed a little bit in more detail on the sustainability workshop um, regarding uh, material selection specifically within Fusion. That's excellent. So 
Diving a little bit deeper into the technical nature of the modeling, um, with modeling in the sculpt workspace, can individuals only work on uh, that space with sculpt tools, or can they use regular solid modeling tools as well? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the great features, and I kind of mentioned this a couple times, is that it's really easy within Fusion to go between workspaces. So if you're working in simulation, you can go back and forth between simulation and modeling um, very quickly. If you're working within Sculpt, you can also go between the Sculpt interface and the modeling interface um, very, very easily. And so what that will allow you to do is say you uh, create a simple model just by using um, extrusion or cut or rotational um, techniques that are more typical of solid modeling. Um, you can then bring that model into the sculpt workspace. It will create a series of T-spline entities like I was demonstrating before, um, which you, you can then manipulate um, using the same manipulator um, in the sculpt workspace that I had demonstrated. And now say, say you take your more simple model um, make some uh, more abstract manipulations to it to make it a more uh, complex form. But now you want to add an extrusion again um, that would just be done with a more standard modeling technique. You can bring that back um, just by changing the workspace. You can just switch back into the modeling workspace and then use your standling, standard modern standard modeling features such as extrusion or cuts or anything like that um, on the same model that you were just working on in the Sculpt workspace. So it's really, really easy to go back and forth uh, between okay. the two. Great. That, that's really good to know. On a, on a more practical organizational level, maybe it's a question that goes to Zoe, for organizations that are looking to access these tools, let's say whether you're a startup or you're an academic institution, is there a, a limit to the number of users that can access the software? Uh, do you, can you only have three per organization or is it an infinite? Could you just speak to that a little bit? Sure. I mean, it's kind of on a case by case, but there is no limit in terms of user. We do have a limit based on uh, the license uh, length. So, but typically for startup, we provide free licenses for, the, for three years, and then we can mm -hmm. start discussing the engagement. But, you know, our team is really built around supporting organizations that have uh, products um, and using design in the social and environmental sector. And so we work very closely with this organization on looking at uh, what do they need for support, and we try our best. Mm -hmm use our resources to um, to help them achieve impact. So this is why, um, as I said, it, it is kind of on a case-by-case -case basis where we can uh, talk with the organization if there is a need for a very large number of licenses or if there, there is a need for an extension over uh, the three-year period. Very cool. Um, uh, I'm not seeing any additional questions come in, so I think uh, the uh, demonstration was quite thorough, and uh, we really appreciate you all taking the time to join us today. Uh, Zoe and Andrea, this has been super insightful, and certainly I encourage our listeners to take advantage of the tools, especially if they are practicing impact design, uh, because it's really great to, to be able to access um, these tools uh, without uh, any cost, uh, especially for those who are watching their budgets in, as a startup in the impact design space. So with that, I'd like to thank you, our presenters. Uh, it's been really great to have you join us. I'd like to thank all of our attendees. Uh, for those of you who are interested in getting your professional development hours, please use the code listed on the slide you see in front of you. If you have questions that come up after the webinar, please feel free to email us at webinars.engineeringforchange.org. And of course, don't forget to become an E4C member to get information on upcoming webinars. With that, I wish all of you a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are joining us from, and we hope to catch you on the next E4C webinar. Thank you. Goodbye.